This episode is sponsored by The Alcohol Experiment, a free 30-day challenge designed to interrupt your patterns, give you control, restore your health, and put you back in touch with the version of you who doesn't need alcohol to cope, relax, or enjoy life. More than 220,000 people have already tried The Alcohol Experiment for themselves and have seen improved sleep, increased happiness, reduced anxiety, and so much more. Join thousands in this inspiring, hopeful, and exciting program where you examine your beliefs and reconnect with the best version of you without ever feeling like you're missing out. Start today for free at alcoholexperiment.com. Hi, this is Annie Grace and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast. I'm here with Crystal. Hi, Crystal. How are you? Hi, Annie. I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Thanks for being here. It's awesome. I love your artwork. I have lots of artwork like that around. Uh, Yes, this is my son's masterpiece. Masterpieces. That's all, I love that. So why don't you sort of take us back to the beginning in your journey uh, with alcohol? Where did it all start for you? Sure. So I feel like for my journey, we have to go way back to the beginning. Um, my, my parents were divorced before I was born. My dad left my mom. Um, and so I kind of had a rocky childhood growing up. There was a lot of moving around, um, some some financial insecurity, living with my mom. She was a a single mom um, working a minimum wage job. And there was a lot of um, there was a lot of stress from the divorce, like ongoing custody battles. I was sort of right in the center of it from my earliest days. Um, so a lot of anxiety there fighting. I developed some attachment issues with my mom. I, I really hated to be away from her and some early coping mechanisms too, like just sort of disassociating from, you know, fighting scenarios or times when I felt really uncomfortable. Um, and then when I was about eight years old, my mom remarried and it was like a total new life. Um, she married a really great guy. We moved to this like idyllic small town. And um, I remember just feeling really out of place. Like I had just gone from one life to a different life. In some ways I thrived. Like I was involved in a lot of extracurriculars and um, you know, I was doing really well in school. I was in like an enrichment program and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, I felt really out of place. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like we sort of left who we were behind. Mm -hmm. And there was also still ongoing stuff with my dad. It was still really tense between my parents and going there every other weekend. And, and when I was at my dad's, you know, I wasn't allowed to mention my mom or talk about, you know, if I, if I was struggling or anything like that. So, so it was just kind of living in this discomfort became pretty regular for me. Um, I also felt like in this new life, a lot of pressure to be perfect. Like it just seemed like, you know, the, the, what was expected of me. And to this day, I'm, I'm not totally sure whether it was real or perceived, but just a lot of pressure to be perfect. We're living a perfect life in a perfect small town, you know, that sort of thing. Um, then came high school and my friend group sort of shifted and I became more disengaged. I, I dropped my extracurriculars. I lost interest in school. And I just remember feeling like even more out of place and just really angry and not really sure why, but, you know, typical teenage angst, but also, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, my dad sort of, it became apparent at that point in my life that he had a drinking issue up until then I wasn't aware, but, um, some, some really sort of big events happened. He was a very prominent dairy farmer. Um, he was like a, a world renowned, like he won all these awards. He was sort of infamous in the dairy industry. And then that was around 2003 and the mad cow stuff hit and the borders closed, So his, he sort of went from being on top of his career to just like a great big fall. Um, He was drinking a lot. He ended up uh, having an affair on my stepmom with a 22 year old and sort of that life fell apart for him. And again, I felt like right smack dab in the center of it. Like I was struggling with, I already had my own feelings about discomforts going there. And now I had to kind of navigate between my stepmom and my brother and sister who lived with my stepmom and and my dad. And so there, it was just really messy. Um, 
And at the same time, like I said, I was becoming more disengaged with school and, you know, living in a small town, there's a lot of booze around. Um, and I just started drinking. Like I just started partying. And I remember from like the very first time I drank, I drank to excess and just like living for that feeling of like it just taking it all away. Like just, you know, I don't even have to try and disassociate now. I can just do it with this substance. So yeah, lots of partying in high school. Um, obviously that, you know, I became even more disengaged. My grades really fell. Um, the jig was sort of up in my household, the sort of idyllic lifestyle. And I felt a lot of shame from my mom and my stepdad about, you know, I, I, all this potential that I had flushed down the drain, all that sort of stuff. Um, but that just pushed me to drink even more and to adopt this sort of persona of a party girl even more. It became my identity. It became my coping mechanism. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot of binge drinking, um, a lot of shame even from the beginning about like how I was acting when I was drinking. Um, and after high school that continued, I moved into a house with a couple guys and it was like a total party house. The, you know, the drinking and the substance use, it really ramped up. Um, it, it wasn't a very good sort of situation. And um, at the same time, like I kind of started partying with my dad a little bit. And, you know, there's some stuff there about, you know, as, as tough as that relationship was, I always wanted his love and his approval. And so it was, I was happy at the time, like, okay, I have a parent who doesn't judge me and who I can connect with. And, um, and that felt nice, but yeah, at the same time, it was kind of a downward spot, downward spiral for me. Um, and then and then I got the call that uh, my dad had tried to take his own life one night. Mm -hmm. That was sort of a, like a, not a wake up call because nothing really changed, but it was like, whoa, okay, this is, this is kind of bad. I'm, I'm not in a good place. Um, and so when I got that call too, like I've thought a lot about this and I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I, I also know where I was at that time. The first thought that I had was like, why was I not enough for you to live for? Mm -hmm. Like, why, you know, why, why wasn't I enough? Um, obviously I know now he'd had a lot of struggles and I understand all that now. Um, but yeah, that was hard. So I kind of poured myself into being there for him. I spent a lot of my time in the psych ward with him um, where he was staying. That was a really depressing place. Um, and just feeling like, you know, like I needed to be there for him. I was still partying pretty hard myself. Um, I eventually managed to get away from that house where I was living, like that really chaotic party house. And I got myself a full-time job and, um, my dad got out of the psych ward, life kind of went on. He continued drinking. I continued partying, but I also noticed around that time too, this is my early twenties, like a duality was emerging in me where like on the one hand, I, I had this total party girl attitude. I wanted to drink and get obli obliti obliviated all the time. But on the other hand, there was like something in me that was propelling me to, to do something with my life. Um, I started kind of getting promoted at my crappy little retail job and um, I enrolled part-time in some university courses. And so like, I, I kind of had this conflicting thing going on where on the one hand, I was just partying like five nights a week out of control, totally binge drinking, doing things that I was completely ashamed of, looking for love in all the wrong places. But on the other hand, I was really trying again to kind of maintain that persona of I'm, I'm holding it together. I've got a job. I'm doing well at it. Um, so that kind of continued throughout my, my early twenties. And, and during that time, my dad's drinking got even more sort of out of control. Like there were a couple father's days where my sister and I, we would go and try and take him out for dinner and he'd be fine when we pick him up, but we didn't know he was hiding, um, vodka in his, toilet tank so we'd go into the washroom and 
down a bunch of vodka and come out we drive to the restaurant and by the time we got to the restaurant like he couldn't even stand we'd have to like carry him out of the restaurant um there was another time where he was hiding it in the hood of his car just like really really out of control he started to go in and out of jail um there was another suicide attempt and then he started um showing up at my work sometimes when he had been drinking. And so at that point I moved from sort of feeling like I needed to take care of him. And like, he was kind of the only parent that really I had a connection with to, okay, I got to kind of back away from this relationship a little bit. I got to put some distance here. So, um, that was hard to sort of come to that realization. Like I need to put a bit of distance here. Um, but I did. And, um, and yeah, and then you know, I was, I was thinking about this in preparation for talking to you today. And I remember during those years, those early twenties of binge drinking, like having the thought many times, like, I wish I could just go to rehab. I wish like, that sounds so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I wish I could just take a week and, or a month, remove myself from all of this and just focus on myself. And, but then the immediately next thought would be, but that means saying that I don't have anything together. That means giving up that like last little bit of dignity that I feel like I'm like holding on to for dear life right now, because at the time, you know, it's the classic story. I thought it was like, I either say I'm like my dad or I've got my shit together. Like, which one is it? Right. So I never, I never, went anywhere with that thought it was just a, a thought that I had over and over again in those early 20 days somehow I managed to um to go back to school full-time I enrolled in university full-time and I also I met um I met somebody who like sort of for the first time in my life treated me with a lot of respect and so I feel like by mid twenties, I kind of was shifting. I was moving away from the, the binge drinking and sort of discovering some things that I liked about myself and discovering some interests that I had. I started doing really well um, in university and I was encouraged by some professors to pursue grad school, which I, I did. I ended up going um, and getting a master's degree and uh, moving in with my partner and things kind of seemed seemed like they were looking up there was still you know I was still drinking probably more than I should have been and there was definitely some like blackout drinking times but it wasn't like the five six nights a week that it had been in my early 20s I I kind of felt like I had more more going on in my life than just drinking um and then during my master's degree, my dad passed away. Um, he had a, a pulmonary embolism, which we've since learned is quite related to um, all his substance abuse and use. And um, at that point, yeah, it, his drinking and, and drug use had escalated considerably. So um, that was really tough, but but I, I got through it. Um, and then like, Six months later, I was almost done my master's degree. I found out I was pregnant. And um, and then again, like, you know, cliche story, like gave up drinking completely, didn't have a drop of alcohol throughout my pregnancy. I remember feeling relieved, um, like, wow, I get to go nine months without being hungover. And I get to go like nine months without being embarrassed about something I've done. Like, this is great. Um finished my master's degree, had my baby boy, and uh, we bought a house. I started a PhD at that point and, um, you know, felt felt pretty good about things. Having my son sort of changed my worldview, changed the, the meaning that I was looking for in my life. Mm. Um, you know, things felt good. And then and then like slowly the drinking crept back in, but it was different this time. It was, you know, it was like the mommy wine culture. And mm -hmm. so it took me a long time to recognize it because it was so different from like the clearly 
problematic binge drinking of my early 20s or of my father. It was like, you know, I'm, I'm doing a PhD. I own a house. I have a son, but I'm having a couple of glasses of wine every night. So what, what's the big deal? Um, but you know, it, it, it started as one or two and then more and more, um, I realized that it still kind of had control over me and, and it was also, there were also a few times where there was like social occasions, not every time, but once I described it as like, it was like rolling the dice. Like I, I never know if like it was going to be a blackout night or not. I didn't want it to be. And usually it wasn't, but once in a while it was. And like, I remember now I'm like in my early thirties in this part of the story. And like, I remember, um, one night we went out for my birthday with some friends and the next day somebody retold the story to me that I guess at the, the bar that we were at, my friend had started chatting with this guy and I, for some reason, didn't like this guy or whatever. And I took off my shoe and I threw it at him mm. and like, you know, we all laughed about it, like, haha. But inside, I was mortified. I was like, holy crap, I'm a 33 year old woman and a mother and a PhD student. And I threw a shoe at somebody's head. Like, wow. I remember that being kind of a moment for me of like, this is not, this is not good. Um, you know, but I, I still didn't, didn't stop drinking. It was just like, okay. No, got to keep a lid on that. Can't let that happen again. Um, yeah, so continued, you know, kind of drinking my nightly glass or two of wine. I did, um, I did dry January in 2020. And I remember feeling really good and, and thinking that, you know, that was great. But I, I also knew from the beginning, it was only going to be a month, like it, it was never going to be a a long-term thing for me, um, went right back to drinking. And then of course the pandemic started and, um, like many people, I think my drinking kind of escalated a little bit. Um, and I remember too, at the time, and like, of course the, the power of social media is everybody looks like they've got their, their life together a lot more, but just thinking like, how is everybody being so productive with their time right now? Like everybody's at home on lockdown and all these people are doing all these great things. And I'm just tired all the time. And I'm just like, I don't have any energy or drive for any of these things. Um, but I, I still didn't quite link it to the drinking. And then, um, and I also just, yeah, I was really tired all the time. And then I did dry January again in 2021. And this time I really noticed like, wow, I'm not as tired and I'm not as anxious and, you know, I feel really good, but February 1st came and started drinking again. But the, the contrast of that really, um, it was like, I noticed immediately how much my sleep quality went down in February when I started drinking again, like, and I also noticed, you know, it was so clear to me, I'd say like, okay, I'm just gonna have one or two glasses of wine. And then I'd be on like glass number three. And I like, as I'm sitting there drinking it, I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't want to be doing this, but I'm going to do it. And I'm probably going to have another one after this. And just, just that's what really made it clear to me that I didn't have control over my drinking. And I just, I just noticed the quality of my life compared to January and February. So one day I Googled how to stop drinking or something like that. And, um, I stumbled across Laura McCowan's blog and, and she had a post of, um, a bunch of different books that you could read that were, and it was just so shocking to me. These weren't like, you know, you're an alcoholic, here's how to deal with it. It was like, you know, here's stories of other people who decided to give up drinking and, had a great life after. And so I ordered a bunch of the books. I think the first one I read was Catherine Gray's Unexpected Joy of Being Sober. And I just thought like, wow, okay, like, here we go. Where was this in my early twenties? Like this, this is great. This is what I want for myself. Um, and then I also, I came across your podcast and I listened to it like 
thank goodness I stumbled across it when there was already like three to 400 episodes because I just listened to it any minute that I wasn't like working or hanging out with my kid. I just had it on in my headphones and it just, I just, I just never drank again and I felt great. And, um, and here we are. And it's, it's funny. It's like probably exactly one year later that we're talking today. Oh, wow. Crystal, that's amazing. And it's just, gosh, other people's stories are like the most powerful, most powerful thing, right. To just Mm -hmm. find hope and possibility and solidarity and all the things. Um, Wow. Uh, a few things I wanted to to circle back to, like just when you were saying how, you know, at the beginning about how when your dad attempted to take his life and you you felt like, why wasn't I enough? I just wanted, I don't know, I know I'm sure you've heard this before, but just validate like children, like it doesn't matter if we're old children, adult children, young children, we always make everything our parents do about us. Always. <laughs> like there's never a case where that's not true. And and I think it's so important for us to know as, as parents, you know, that our children are, I mean, it can be that I've had a, you know, tiring day at work and, and, and I'm a pretty peaceful person. And if, you know, there's any snag in my energy or anything's off, my kids think it's about them mm-hmm. and, you know, they, they have a relatively peaceful life. So it's just, it's just so so true. It's, it's one of those things that as children, that's just what we do, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's true. I've been doing a lot of reflection over this past year on, you know, how I've, how I've interpreted the events through my life. And, um, and yeah, I, I do see a lot of the things my dad did and I haven't quite figured out how to let it go. It's like cognitively, I can know that it's not about me, but at the same time, there's like just this little voice in the back. That's like, well, but, but you weren't enough. Right. And like, same with, you know, the, the divorce, like, you know, why, why did he leave when I wasn't even born yet? He hadn't even met, me. you know, Mm -hmm. he didn't even give me a chance. But um, it's funny because I've realized I, I'm very sensitive to other people's actions and I make a lot of what other people do about me. So it's been refreshing to sort of see that I do that because, you know, awareness is the first step. You can mm-hmm. stop and say, well, maybe that isn't about me, even in the smallest actions right? Like the person that flips you off in traffic, like it doesn't have to be about you. It's just, they had a crappy day. And so I do find comfort in, in shifting my mind with the small things. And I'm hopeful that if I kind of keep doing that, I'll be able to get enough perspective that some of these bigger things in life won't feel so much about me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think that you're right. Like not only is awareness the first step, but often it's, it's the hardest and biggest step, like awareness yeah. by itself can do so much to shift things. And also the gift of being a parent as they grow up. Um, and as they really start to verbalize and tell you all the ways that they feel like you're making whatever's going on with you about them, it does give you some perspective of like, wow, literally almost nothing I do is about my kids when, from an upset perspective, of course, mm-hmm. there's a lot of joy that I get from them, but like, when, like, I can't even none of my like stress or anxiety, like none of the stuff going on with me is about my kids. And so it's been really, really great too. Um, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Or did you No, I was just saying, yes. Yeah. Um, I feel you. Also, I just, I just wanted to circle back to that feeling of like, I, I just wish I could go to rehab and just to comment on how how I think we all really need to hear that we can both desperately want to stop and, and, and keep going at the same time. And our brain tells us those those things shouldn't be able to live in tandem in the same mind or within the same heart, but like they do. And our brain then tells us where there must be something really wrong with you, because how can it be that you both want to check into rehab and you're drinking, like how can those two things exist? And so we start to judge ourselves. And I just thought, you know, you said it so, so directly 
And it's just worth bringing attention to the fact that we can have those two completely conflicting feelings. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us. It doesn't mean like that um, we're somehow broken or, you know, they have a screw loose or anything like that because we have two wildly conflicting feelings and they both feel incredibly true, right? Mm -hmm. Both the desire to drink nothing or less and the desire to keep drinking, they both feel incredibly true. And Mm -hmm. I think we just add suffering to the whole situation when we judge ourselves because how can that be? Well, it is. So I don't know how it can be, but it just is, right? Yeah, I agree. And I like, I think when I was having those thoughts, I knew that, I knew that I couldn't stop on my own. Like I just knew that it wasn't something I could do at that time. I didn't have the capabilities at that time to take care of myself. So it was like my way of wanting help. But to me, that help was so directly linked to relinquishing power like relinquishing and and because I've struggled for so long with my own worth it's like I a little fighter inside of me was like you can't give up that last bit of worth like you have some power in there you you know what I mean so it was it it was really it was really conflicting like you said to to feel like I I want help but I also want I want I want to nourish the part of me that can also take care of myself. You know, why does it have to be one or the other? Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, you did do it on your own. I guess so. Yeah. (laughs) Like you really did take in some information in a book or a podcast, but like, no, that, that really was all you, right. Mm -hmm. Just worth it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's awesome. So let me ask you the question that I kind of finish up with this is if you were going to go back and talk to that crystal who both felt, you know, um, that she wanted help, but also knew it wasn't the time and just tell her a little bit about what life is like now, what would you say to her? Gosh, I, um, I would just tell her it's okay. You know, it's, you're not an epic failure. You're not your dad. Um, And I would just want to tell her that you know, you know you're meant to have a life worth living. And it's like, all the things you're searching for, all the, all the love and acceptance and, and self-worth, like the, there's a barrier, there's something in your way. It's not you that is worthless. It's, Mm. there's something in the way of you seeing your own worth. It's there. It's just being blocked. And for me, it was being blocked 100% by alcohol there was just no way I was going to get to it. Um, and so relatedly, you know, since, since I stopped drinking, like, you know, I found it, I found the worth. And part of that has just been something that's always been there. And part of it is, you know, without being numb, I'm, I can live my life according to my own principles. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be a vegetarian because I love animals and I believe in animal welfare, like things like that. Like you're just going to live every day according to who you are. And so this newfound worth is going to grow like just naturally from that because you're living your every day. Um, yeah, according, according to your own principles. And also, you know, you the, the meaning part, like finding meaning in life, like it's not just going to appear, like you're going to be able to create it. Mm. With, and, and it's like, instead of the alcohol having the reins and, and just feeling like I'm like sludging through life, it's like, I have the 
the reins again. I, I can design my life now. I have the, the confidence to design it and the drive and the want to design it. And there's still a lot of, you know, healing and there's a lot of processing I need to do, but I can do it now because I've got these like foundational pieces in place. And, and also I'm like learning who I am. Like, I feel like I went so long trying to like please others and be what I thought others wanted me to be. And it's like, no, I, I, I'm going to explore my wants and find those like childhood things that make me happy and like reintroduce myself to myself. And, and just life is just so much better that way. <laughs> I love that. I, I, um, I saw a quote recently and it said like, it is not about becoming somebody, but really unbecoming all the things that aren't authentically you, you know, it is so much more about un undoing all the blocks than it is about trying to be who you're not it's just getting back in touch with that you because that you came into the world right and it's just it just gets blocked by a lot of different things in a lot of different ways so that's just awesome yeah yeah well thank you so much crystal this has been really fun and i really enjoyed the conversation and i appreciate you coming on and sharing your story thank you annie this is really really cool this is a special day for me so so I appreciate talking to you today and I appreciate you being there for me in the soundtrack to my sobriety. <laughs> I love that. That's so great. Have you tried the alcohol experiment? Okay, if not, drop everything and go to alcoholexperiment.com. This is a free 30-day challenge and it's designed to interrupt your patterns and put you back in touch with that best version of you. You remember, it was that version of you that's living your most joyful life, that version that didn't need alcohol to relax or have a good time, the one that's able to have more fun than ever. Again, this is a totally free challenge and it can change everything for you. So learn more and join me for a 100% free challenge at alcoholexperiment.com. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps me reach somebody who might need to hear this message today.